when I do workshops on this topic, I always like to start by asking students to think of examples themselves of when, when they were students, uh, what were some assignments that they found particularly engaging. And when you have, um, when you have them describe what those assignments are, they always seem to have some characteristics in common, or at least some, at least some of these characteristics in common. Um, one of them is they start out by just um, arousing the student's curiosity about the topic so that they want to learn a little bit more about it. Um, another really important part of it is that the assignment should have a, cl a clear goal, that they should um, be able to tell exactly what's expected of them, and that it's um, complex enough that they're not able to just go find the answer in their textbook or find the answer on the internet. Um, when you have assignments like that, it immediately feels like busy work to students and they, they just feel like the entire goal is to copy something down from some other source and that's not very exciting to them. Um, but they should feel um, confident that they can complete the assignment using the resources that they have, but they should also have some um, freedom to inject their own personalities into it. So they, there shouldn't be only one right way to do it. There should, they should be able to have some flexibility in how they achieve the assignment. Um, uh, it should be something that feels useful <laughs> to them. So it feels like, like a skill that they're learning is something they're going to have to use again, either later in the class or perhaps in their professional lives. Um, and um, when they're working to achieve the goal, they should feel confident that they're going to be rewarded for um, the amount of um, the amount of really core content that they're achieving, and not that they're not going to be penalized too much for little ticky tack things like spelling errors, or that the margins are wrong. They should really that that most of the the, the grade for it should be focused on whether they've actually learned something of significance from it. I've always thought of it as as kind of a multi-step process. And so the very first thing that you have to do when you're creating any kind of a new assignment is to, is to start with the goal, to start with the goal in mind. So what is it that you want students to be able to achieve afterwards? Um, it's, sometimes it's really hard to articulate that, but that's the first thing that you have to do because everything that you do subsequent to that has to fit with that goal, otherwise it doesn't belong in this assignment. So articulate the goal first. Um, the second thing to do is to actually think of what you want the students to do in support of that goal. This is the hardest part, and it's the part that it's very difficult for me to speak about in a generic way because I don't know what your particular goal is. I don't even know what your field is, um, and so you need to you need to brainstorm along with people who know your field better than you and who understand what your goal is um, to figure out what's the best way to achieve that goal. But there's a book um, by Angela and Cross. It was written in 1993 called um, Classroom Assessment Techniques that's really useful for jumpstarting your imagination. So I highly recommend that book. It's got everything in there from having students make lists, concept mapping is in there, um, just having them write down little papers about what they learned in today's lecture, that kind of thing. You can also have much, much more uh, in-depth types of assignments where students have to go out and interview experts, where they have to take their cameras out on campus and take pictures of the concepts that you're trying to talk about in class. Um, there's just the, the sky is the limit, having them make videos, having them make their own classroom presentations. Um, there are so many different ways that you can, um, that you can reinforce a goal, but it depends on what your goal is. So I can't really say, here's how you, here's how you do that part. That's the super creative part of this. Once you think you have an assignment in mind, the third thing to do is to actually try the assignment yourself. So pretend you're a student and actually try it. There's been lots of times where I've written an assignment prompt and then thought, okay, let's see, let me write a sample uh, answer for this, especially for my online class. I put a sample assignment for everything that, that I assigned so students can see what they're supposed to be doing. And sometimes when you write that sample, you realize that either it's impossible or it's way too big or it's way too small or the answer is already out there. So just by, by practicing with it, you see whether you're, you're missing anything big. Um, the fourth thing to do is to create the rubric that you'll use to evaluate the students. And you can give this to the students. A lot of people think that you should and other people think that you shouldn't, but whatever, it's going to be, you're going to need it anyways when you grade. So you might as well do the rubric up front. And then make sure that uh, the elements of the rubric, that the most important thing, so go back to what your goal was and make sure that that goal is the most important thing that's being reflected in your rubric, that it's not trivia that's being reflected in your rubric. but 
actually whether the students have achieved mastery of the goal. So, um, so tweak that rubric. Sometimes that requires you to go back and tweak the assignment to make sure that they're spending the most effort on the most important things. Um, and then the fifth thing, if it's at all possible, is to then you unleash it on your students and then actually watch them do it, uh, at least part of it. It might not be possible to watch them do all of it, but see what conversations it sparks among the students, see if they stay on task, see what questions they have about it, see what wasn't clear about what they were supposed to have been doing, been doing, and then you can correct some of those things on the fly, and you can also say, all right, this is okay for now, but next time I do this assignment, I'm definitely doing this differently. So don't be afraid to listen to what your students are talking about as they're trying to do whatever it is that you're having them do. Um, I teach a non-majors biology class, and one of the first topics that we um, talk about is science and how um, experiments are developed. And uh, this, in this involves some specialized vocabulary like control and standardized variables and independent variable and dependent variable. And so I want them real early on to work with those terms, but not to be intimidated by the science content. So, um, so I have them test, I have them develop experiments to test hypotheses about, um, that, are, that derive from sayings, like an apple a day keeps the doctor away, or blondes have more fun, or breaking a mirror will give you seven years of bad luck, or something like that. And they have to figure out a way to design an experiment that would test whether that's actually true or not. And in doing so, they have to figure out what would be an appropriate control and what would be the standardized variables. And they have to apply that terminology that they've just learned. Um, and so that's when they work together in small groups to do those. And then after they finish designing their experiments, they trade so they can learn from what the other groups have done. And they're not all doing the same hypotheses. They're all doing different ones. And so they can have to think through another one in evaluating another group's work. I start with a short lecture on um, the nature of science, what are the questions that science can and can't answer, um, and then talk about how there's different kinds of science, and the one that we're going to be talking about is um, experimental, um, it's using experiments to test hypotheses. And then I show them a movie of, it's a 10 minute movie clip about how um, they discovered that this disease called pellagra was caused by a vitamin B deficiency. And then we go through um, the elements of the experiment that this fellow did to figure out that vitamin B deficiency causes pellagra. And then I hand out these sheets and the sheets say, all right, uh, you've got one that says an apple, an apple a day. And so you're in a team of four students and yours says apple a day keeps the doctor away and this team says, if you break a mirror, then you'll have seven years of bad luck. And this one says, if you spit on a bat before you use it for the first time, then it'll be lucky. You know, like that kind of thing. That sheet has very clear instructions on what to do. That they have to um, design the experiment, so give an overview of how the experiment would work, and then talk about the sample size, and talk about the, what's the independent vari variable, and the dependent variable, what would be the control, and so forth. It takes about... Um, 15 or 20 minutes. It's the first group thing that they do, so there's a lot of getting to know you type stuff going on there too. Um, so maybe 15 or 20 minutes they've got this sheet pretty much filled up with the design of the experiment, and then whenever they're finished then they trade with another group. And that other group has to look at that and evaluate, did they use the word control correctly? Did they use standardized variable correctly? Did they use dependent and independent variable? And you can see what students struggle with is what's the appropriate control. It's sometimes really hard to know and the difference between dependent and independent variable because those terms sound so similar they have trouble remembering which one is which. So they help each other with that. Um, and then right away for the next couple of weeks in lab they're also designing experiments and so that is something that, that's building a foundation that they're going to be using over and over again in the class. So even if they're not going to be designing experiments as a profession, at least it is something that, that um, helps them be more successful and more efficient in less. I think that's really cool that they have to sift through all these possibilities and come up with something that would work. And maybe another one would also work, but that's okay. They don't have to come up with all possible experiments. They just have to find one that would work. And I really, um, I think that's, that's nice because there's some creativity, but it's not so crazy that they have no idea how to even approach it. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is concept mapping, which to me is one of the single most powerful um, study techniques and just learning tools that I can think of. 
uh, again, when you're talking about, well, I'm talking about an introductory class, but when you're talking about any kind of class, there's always new content that students will be tempted to memorize the individual words. That they, they're tempted to memorize the vocabulary but not understand how it all fits together. And a concept map takes those individual words and forces them to draw out on paper how those topics fit together. So it's enormously powerful because it works at the introductory level, it works all the way up to the senior, the graduate level. I've learned plots of operas by making a concept map of them. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's such an incredible tool for just figuring out how complex pieces fit together. One of the rules is that, um, so you're going to make a list of terms. It could be at least 10, probably 10 to 20. You can have as many as you want. If you have a lot of paper, you can make a huge concept map. So it can be as many as you want. But let's say you start with 10 terms on a list. And so the rules are that those terms are going to be in boxes on the paper or on the board or wherever you're doing it. And then um, the terms are connected to each other by arrows. And the arrow has a label on it that describes the relationship. So. Uh, if, if you have two terms like atom and molecule, then you would have atom in a box and molecule in a box. And then you might have an arrow that goes from molecule to atom. It says molecules are made of atoms. But then you also have the word cell and you also have DNA as an example of a molecule. And all of these things are going on inside of cells and uh, multicellular organisms are made of multiple cells. So you can see how you can go on and on and on forever with this basic terminology of biology, but you could do it for history, you could talk about which events are contributing to which events. And for dance, I imagine that there are ways that you could talk about which different kinds of things are going on in different styles of dance or whatever. It's, it's incredibly flexible. And all it takes is those rules that the words go in boxes, um, that the arrows between them are labeled, and there can't be any stragglers, just like there is no place on Earth that you can't get to from some other place on Earth. You can't have any little, you know, islands of terminology that aren't connected to anything else because why would we have talked about it if it wasn't connected to the rest of it? So there must be some way that everything connects. To yeah, that's actually the best part. So when I do these in action centers, I'm the the students. Maybe there will be a group of ten students at action center. And maybe I'll write twenty words on the board, and they have to, they each take a turn to go up and add something to the concept map. And you can see the easy stuff goes first, and then there's always a set of three or four words at the end that nobody wants. Nobody wants them because they don't get how they fit in. And then you can start going, okay, so. This is a particularly difficult concept, and it helps me shape my own teaching in the future when I can see what's hard for students now. Perhaps write it out in words instead of using this graphical one. Try to write it out in a linear in a linear way, because um, that's a whole different way of organizing information when you don't get that flat space, but you have to tell a narrative in order, you have to give a lot of thought to what has to come before what. So that might be a good follow-up just to make them think about the material in a different way. I mean, this, this concept mapping thing, uh, uh, it's, it's so incredibly powerful. Um, I do it one time in class, and we do it often in Action Center. And the one time we do it in class, you can see that students who thought they got it because they got, they understood the meaning of every single, every individual word, and then they try to put it together, and you see how difficult it is. And then I'll stop the class after maybe 10 minutes of working on it, and I'll say, does this make everybody's brain, hurt? does this make everybody's brain hurt? And they're like, yeah, it's really hard. Well, that's what learning feels like. You know, learning isn't easy. Learning isn't what you do while you're looking at the book when you're really watching TV. You know, that's not, there's not learning happening. Learning only happens when you're actually struggling to put the pieces together. You know, years later, students will still come up to me and say, I went to that when I was a freshman and I still do concept maps and it's totally changed the way I've studied for every class. So I can go on and on about how, um, how, what a revelation is it is to students who have gotten used to just memorizing memorizing vocabulary that that was okay in high school, that it got them over that hump to becoming much better students and it helped them learn the content. So, I mean, what more can you ask for?